My name is Dan, if I don't know you. I'm senior pastor here at LifePoint Church. Have you ever had a question about God that you didn't want to tell anyone before? Have you ever had a question and you're like, hey, who said yes, you're out? No, that's the thing. We often feel like we're going to get kicked out or it's wrong if we have some question about God and we're like, oh, hang on, I, I'm not allowed to think that. I'm not allowed to say that. Over the next kind of three weeks, well, last week, this week, and next week, we're asking some of the big questions. I was just talking to someone this morning, talking about that horrific thing that happened down in Bondi. How horrible was that? People are asking the question, why would God allow something like that to happen? Like, it's, it's a big question. How does this world work? I, I, I used to, I'm not a very good person when it comes to details. Anyone that knows me knows that I don't do details very well. And um, I, in, in one of my last jobs, before I became a pastor, I used to fly a lot. I used to, used to fly, you know, Sydney or Melbourne or sometimes around Queensland. And the problem with me flying all the time is that I very quickly forgot all the details of my flights. And I almost didn't make it to many flights. In fact, one of the worst ones that ever happened was I, I was flying down to Sydney. I looked at the gate. Yep, know where I'm going. Sat down at the gate. Put my headphones on. I was just sitting there chilling, reading a book. And I'm keep looking at my watch thinking, this, this flight's pretty late. It was 40 minutes late in the end. And I'm like, what are these guys doing? Blim and Qantas. Sorry, there's some Qantas people here today. And uh, finally, they start calling the flight. So I'm there in the back of the line. I always get to the back of the line because, you know, otherwise you can sit on the plane for too long. I finally get there, give them my ticket. He goes, beep, beep, beep. He's like, sir, this is a flight to Sydney. I'm like, that's right. He's like, we're going to Rockhampton. <laughs> And I'm like, oh, he's like, this flight left 40 minutes ago. <laughs> and then I, ju- I heard, I've, and I was thinking, well, how did it leave? Because I've already checked my bag. And my bag's on the plane somewhere. And I, guess I hear this from the PA system. Last call, please, Daniel Sweetman to gate number 22. And I was like, oh. So I run down to gate number 22. I was at gate number 32. I finally get to gate 22. And I'm like, hi. And they're like, sorry, sir, we're just really busy. And I'm like, oh, I'm Daniel Sweetman. And everyone just turned and they're like, get on that flight now. They were so, they were so angry, justifiably angry. And you know what? The people on the plane were so happy. I got a round of applause when I went down the aisle. I was like, thank you. Thank you. It was one of those long, sarcastic rounds of applause. But I only held everyone up 40 minutes. I've actually had a moment like that in my spirituality as well. I remember when I was about 19, 20 years old, a long time ago now, I remember thinking the same thing. Like, like not am I on the right flight, but like, am I on the right track spiritually? Am I on the right direction? Like, is, is, is Jesus the right path? Like, if we just sang it before, if I'm going to give my life to follow Jesus, if I'm going to give up everything and say, Jesus, you are my king, and my life's now going to be built upon you, that I want to make sure I'm on the right God. I'm on the right track. I'm on the right path. I'm not sure if you've ever had that kind of thought before. We're talking today, is Jesus the right God? Last week, we talked about this guy named Thomas, who really didn't believe that Jesus could rise from the dead, and he was one of his closest friends. He was one of his 12 disciples, and even he couldn't believe it until he could see the evidence right in front of him. And today we're talking about someone else very close to Jesus, who surprisingly had a doubting moment. His name was John the Baptist. If you know nothing about the Bible, John the Baptist was actually Jesus' cousin, and he had a big job. John the Baptist's job was to prepare the way. And he was so passionate about Jesus. If he was like, you know, if he was like, if you grade Christianity on how passionate someone is, John the Baptist is right at the very top. In fact, Jesus himself said, there's never been a prophet greater than my cousin, John the Baptist. That's what Jesus said himself. John the Baptist says things like this. He's talking about, he says, Jesus, he is the one, this is John 1, 27. He's the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John was so sure. He's like, this is the one. As I've seen, and I testify that this is God's chosen one. He was so passionate about Jesus, they told him to stop talking about it, and, and they put him in prison. So you know you're passionate, and you're really full on about something if you get thrown into prison about it. 
That's in Matthew 4, we find that. And then one day, the shocking happens. John the Baptist is sitting in prison, and he hears about what's going on with Jesus, and he has this horrible moment. Maybe you relate to this sometime in your life. He goes, "Uh uh-oh, I think I made the wrong choice. Even John, the, even this guy says that. Here's what it looks like. This is uh, Matthew 11 today. After Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. So far, pretty normal. That's what you'd expect Jesus to do, preach and teach. But when John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect someone else? This is the guy that went around preaching, telling everyone he's the one. He's the one. He's God's chosen one. And now he has this sudden moment. Hang on. Hang on. I'm not sure he's the one. And he sends a delegation out to check. Have you ever had a moment like that before? Sometimes it's called the dark night of the soul. Sometimes it's called hitting the wall. You get a time in your life where you suddenly go, and if you're a faith person here today, which many of you are, you've, it, might be, it might be a faith thing. You're like, you know what? I, maybe it's, I'm not sure God's actually real. Maybe it's, I'm not sure that Jesus is the right God. There seems to be a lot of spiritual options out there. Or maybe it's actually, you, you know, you know God's real because the life doesn't make sense without it. But, but is God even good? Like, how could God do this? Maybe it's like, does God, okay, I know God's real, I know everyone says He's good, and we sing songs about how good God is, but does He care about me? Does He have my best interests at heart? And suddenly you go into this time in your life of extreme doubt, of anxiety, of worry, and suddenly it's a little blip in the radar, and other times it just takes, it derails your entire faith. i got some good news for you today, if that's you. Here's the good news. It's normal. And in fact, it's in the Bible. (laughs) It's biblical, all right? It's biblical to doubt because even Jesus' cousin says that. He's like, oh, I'm not sure. It's really strange. So John the Baptist is, it says, see that passage there when it says in verse 2, he heard about the deeds of the Messiah. See, all of us have a script in our life of what we think our life should look like and what we think God should do about it, don't we? you got a script, you go, all right, I want the next 10 years to look like this God, and I think you should do this and this and this. And John the Baptist had a script about what the Messiah should do. He was a fiery guy. He was telling everyone to repent. He hated sin. John the Baptist is like, repent and believe, you sinners. You saw Israel and the Romans just full of sin, and the Messiah is going to come and he's going to get rid of sin. And then he starts hearing things about the deeds. And someone's like, they're like, oh, what is he doing about sin? And they're like, yeah, he's, he's actually eating with sinners. He's going to parties. He's hanging out with sinners. And I reckon John, Johnny Bapp's like, what? Well, what's he doing about the Romans? Surely he's ripping into the Romans. And they're like, how's it said anything about the Romans? How's it mentioned the government? It's like, what? Why, well, has he got a big following? Is he getting an army together? They're like, no, nah, there's like 12 blokes. It's small. And John the Baptist is like, Oh no, oh dear, all of this work and I've backed the wrong horse. All of this work and I'm on the wrong flight. Oh, one of the reasons I believe that the Bible is so trustworthy is because of stories like this. Like if you're going to make up a religion, I tell you what, don't make up a religion where all of the leaders are so unimpressive. And constantly having doubts and constantly going, I'm not sure about this. Is this really real? Like, it's incredibly honest. It's an incredibly honest book. John the Baptist, the greatest prophet ever, right before his death, right before they killed him for preaching about Jesus, he's, he's doubting. He's deconstructing his faith. He's having second thoughts. If you've ever been in that situation, I know I have, you're in good company, friends. All right? Very good company. But what are we going to do about it? See, what John the Baptist does, which I love, he goes straight to the source. 
to ask his question. He goes straight to Jesus. Well, he doesn't because he's in prison, but he sends people straight to Jesus. And they ask him this incredibly offensive question. What do they ask him? Are you the one? Or should we be expecting someone else? (laughs) No other religion are you allowed to ask those questions about the leaders. (laughs) Like, I don't think in Islam you're allowed to say, yeah, but is, is Muhammad really the prophet? Seriously, is he really, is he really it? I mean, that's not allowed. In Buddhism, you're not allowed to say, yeah, but was Buddha, like, was he really enlightened? Really? Like, Christianity is almost encouraging us to ask these questions, to go to Jesus and go, Jesus, are you it? And Jesus doesn't reply by saying, how dare you? He doesn't reply by saying, John, You were meant to be the prophet. You were meant to be a sold-out believer. Where's your faith? Jesus replies like this, verse 4. Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you hear and see. He says, look around, listen, look into the evidence and make a decision yourself. And tell John the Baptist just what you hear and see. Jesus says, the proof is in the pudding. (laughs) He says, look into it and you'll work it out. And then he quotes from Isaiah 35, which is a book that John the Baptist almost certainly would have known off by heart. And he says, look what's happening, guys. The blind are seeing, the lame are walking, the the lepers are being healed, the deaf are hearing. The good news is being proclaimed. This is exactly what your scripture says is going to happen. Jesus says, look into it. So I just want to spend about five minutes in the middle of this message looking into it for a moment to say, hey, what is the evidence that Jesus is the right God? Because there's lots of options out there. You could believe in God. You can believe in other gods. You could believe in no God. Lots of people in Australia have made that choice. I don't really believe in any kind of God. You can be spiritual but not religious and kind of make up your own, like choose your own adventure, make up your own God as you go along, one that suits you and your lifestyle and what you see. There's lots of options out there, let's be honest. Here's why I'm really glad that we just prayed for our kids and our next generation, is that all the stats say that 58% of our young people in 15 years' time won't be with us because they'll choose somewhere else. They'll choose someone else. And many of you here have got heartbreaking stories about your own kids deciding to choose another option. So we need to be really open about this and totally fine with questions, guys. I want to be a church where if your kid, your grandkid, your nephew, your niece comes to you and asks you a question, you're like, great question. It's good to have questions. We're that kind of church. I'm glad you're using your brain because what you should do is you should look and see. You should look and see and hear what's going on. You should look into the evidence. Here's the thing, guys. We can't get around this. Christianity is an exclusive worldview, all right? This is really offensive for a lot of people. there's, There's no kind of getting around it. There's no adding Jesus in to a mix of beliefs. Christianity says, this is the truth. The first commandment in Exodus, out of the Ten Commandments, is that there's no other gods but the Lord our God, Yahweh. Jesus actually says, I am God incarnate. It's quite a famous verse, one of the most famous things he ever said. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And there's actually no other way. No one's getting to the Father except through me. It's incredibly exclusive, don't you reckon? And people say, well, why? Like, that's really offensive. How can Christians claim to be the only ones that have the truth? How can Christians claim to be like, no, no, every other religion's wrong, and we're the only right ones? Is that intolerant? Is that arrogant to say that we're the only ones that have the truth? It's a good question to ask, isn't it? Because sometimes people say that. It's intolerant to say that you have the truth. Let me say two things about this real quick, okay? The first thing about saying that it's intolerant to say that you've got the only truth is that everyone does this. 
it's not arrogant to claim to have the truth. <laughs> Every belief system claims to have the truth, even those who claim to be tolerant. Like if you, like anything, you, when, when you get up and say something, you say this is true, then you're making an, a statement to say every, everything else is not true. Does that make sense? I remember, I remember reading about a student and a professor, and the student said to the professor, Professor, all claims to have absolute truth are arrogant and intolerant. And the professor said, is that true? This is actually how life works. <laughs> we eliminate options and try and find the truth all the time. My mum had a really big health scare this week. It was quite terrifying, actually. They, a doctor last week diagnosed her potentially with a disease that would have ended her life very quickly. And our whole family was worried about it. We were praying. You know, we're on a text chain. She's saying, here's what's going on. And so she went for this scan on Wednesday. And the Wednesday afternoon, she gets the results. The doctor specialist called her up and said, guess what? You're fine. You haven't got that disease. I look at the scan. I look at the evidence. And you ha- you're, you're fine. I've eliminated that result. That's not, that's not a thing for you. Good news. We're all cheering as a family. We're all praising God. I tell you what my mum didn't do. Oh, okay. That's very arrogant of you and intolerant of you to say that you have the truth. To eliminate every other option. How arrogant. She didn't say that. Because this is not how we live our lives. We live our lives searching for what is real and saying if that, not everything can be true at the same time. We know that. My mum can't be dying and not dying at the exact same time. It's not intolerant to say that you have the truth. The second thing is, and this is a bit controversial, all right? Some of you aren't going to feel really comfortable with this, but stay with me. Number two point is Christianity doesn't say that everything about every other worldview is wrong. It says it's incomplete. Do you hear what I'm saying? Not everything about every other worldview is wrong. And I think we should get better as Christians about affirming some parts of other worldviews that are actually right. Jesus came to complete. In fact, because humans are made in the image of God, often you see good truth, it's called general revelation, actually in what people have come up with to make sense of the world. Let me get controversial for a second. You ready? Islam says there's one God. It's like, true. True. Buddhism says that there's more to life than just this material world. There's actually a spiritual dimension to life, and we should cause no harm because of that. What would you say to that? True. Atheism, humanism, says that every person has inalienable human rights that we should not cross. What would you say to that? True. I don't know how you got there, by the way, but if that's what you believe, true. The Aboriginal Dreamtime stories. I heard a story last year that of the Gamilaroi people on New South Wales. Bayame, the, the sky god, came and he created the world. One creator god came and created the heavens and the earth. That's what their Dreamtime story. What would you say to that? True. It's incomplete. <laughs> but it's still true. Jesus came to complete. He actually came to complete Jewish religion. <laughs> He's like, hey, he, you've, got a, you've got some bits right, but ultimately you need me. Ultimately, everything that you're longing for points to me. I have come to complete everything you've been longing for. That doesn't mean there's not wrong stuff in every other world. Do you? Let me tell you there is. <laughs> if it says that Jesus isn't God, it's wrong. <laughs> I love how Paul in Acts 17, I don't have time to read the story, I better be quick, but in Acts 17, Paul gets to Athens and he gets up and he doesn't say, men of Athens, women of Athens, you've all got it completely wrong, you idiots. He gets up and he says, I notice you're very religious and I notice you've got some, some good stuff going on here. I notice you're passionate about spiritual things. Here's where you need to be completed. Here's the part that you're wrong. And I think when we engage with culture, we should be able to engage and say, there's so much good stuff. There's so many good things about Aussie culture. But it's woefully incomplete. 
It's woefully incoherent, actually. Jesus came to complete everything. And he says to the people, when people ask him, are you the right guy? Are you the one we've been waiting for? He says, look into it. Check out the good news. And once you see how good it is, that will convince you. Christianity, friends, it's an exclusive worldview. Every worldview is an exclusive worldview. (laughs) Every single one is exclusive. In fact, the ones that say they're tolerant are often the most intolerant. Have we seen that recently in our culture? (laughs) The most tolerant ways of saying, hey, we live a lifestyle like this, they become the most intolerant to everyone else. But here's what I want to put to you. Here's what I want to finish today. Christianity is an exclusive worldview and Christianity is the most inclusive worldview. In fact, I think Christianity, if you're not a believer today, I think Christianity is the only actual inclusive worldview. I think that's what Jesus was saying when he said, look around. Look who is getting the good news. Christianity is the most inclusive worldview because it is for every culture. Did you know that Christianity is the only major world religion that was multicultural from the very beginning and has always been multicultural? There's actually no culture associated with Christianity. You go to Africa, you'll find a different kind of cultural version. You go to Latin America, you you go to Russia. You go everywhere and and you'll find people worshipping Jesus in their own way. Same Bible, same God, completely different cultural expression. Well, every other religion's like, oh yeah, that's, that's a Middle Eastern thing, that's an Asian thing, that's an Indian thing. What, what culture do you associate with Christianity? You can't. It's completely multicultural, which is what you would expect if it was true for every single person and every single culture. It would actually fit in. Christianity doesn't overthrow your culture, it completes your culture. No matter where you're from, a lot of people here weren't born in Australia. Christianity, Jesus completes your culture. I remember reading once about an African guy who got converted to following Jesus. And he said, I finally found the one that my ancestors have been beating their drums for for generations. It's him. (laughs) He completes our culture. He's for every culture. How inclusive is that? Number two. Christianity is inclusive because it is, it is for all culture and it is for all creation. See, other religions and other worldviews, they, they try and take you away from the world. They try and get you detached from the world. But Christianity says you are saved to be a blessing to this world. And in fact, God is coming into this world to redeem all of creation. And one day we'll create a new heaven and a new earth. Christianity doesn't turn you away from the world. It actually points you to it as an agent of love and goodness and healing and good news for all of creation. It's so inclusive, it actually includes animals. It's so inclusive, it includes our environment. It includes mountains and trees and and the Great Barrier Reef. The whole thing is included in the Bible. All of creation. And number three, which I think is the most important and the most incredible. Christianity is the most inclusive worldview because it is for every person. Every person. See, every other religion says, change your life and you can receive salvation. If you change yourself, you'll be able to get there. If you can become more moral, if you can obey God better, if you can become holier, if you can become maybe like our Australian worldview, if you can become fitter, if you can become smarter, if you can become more popular, if you can get your life together, if you can, if you, if you can analyze things better or if you can become more successful, if you can get more friends, or maybe even in religion, if you pray more, if you read the Bible more, if you work harder, if you get your life together, you will be able to be saved. We're the only place in the world that says, 
Salvation is here for every person. The person who can't, can't get themselves together. The person who just can't stop stuffing up. The person who's inconsistent. The person who's always getting it wrong. The person who's struggling and trying to do their best, but they just don't seem to be able to do it. The person who never does their best. They never have their entire life. The whole range of people. Every single person is welcomed in the kingdom of God. And Jesus stretches out his arms and he says, I love you this much. And he dies on the cross for you. The gospel, Christianity says, this is what Jesus, exactly what Jesus said. There's good news for the poor. Because the poor were left out of every other system. They couldn't get themselves holy. They couldn't get themselves together. Jesus is like, that's the very people I've come for. Every person. In fact, there's only one group of people that Jesus couldn't come for. Those who don't think they need him. <laughs> that's it. Every other worldview, at the, at the very bottom of it, it says, be better. Whereas at the very bottom of Christianity is this beautiful thing called the grace of God. Every other worldview says change and you can receive salvation. Christianity says be saved and it will change your life. Anyone need some grace here this morning? <laughs> Anyone just feel like they just need grace? You're just like, I just, I've had, it's been one of those weeks. Or maybe it's been one of those five years for you. You just need the grace of God. You just need the love of God. Every other worldview at the very heart says, do. Christianity says, it's done for you. <laughs> you don't want to build your life on anything else, friends, but the love of God, I can tell you. You don't want to build your life on any other foundation than Jesus. He's the only way. <laughs> He's the only truth. He's the only light. Amen.